with the new record keeping requirement, it's going to allow employers to look at, you can, when you go, go on their website, you can look up other employers that qualify to be, requi to be reporting and, and keeping their records to compare themselves in the marketplace to other employees or other employers. And that was based off an executive order that President Obama put in place, uh, 13707. And they based that off of a behavioral science study that shows, and this is the, their thinking, that if you have this information out available, let's say just for example, Walmart, Target can look at Walmart's information, compare themselves to it, and if, there's, if they see, hey, we have more workplace injuries than Walmart does, we need to step it up, we need to get better. So there is a general principle behind it that's, that's positive, and that, that was the reasoning for doing so. Now, whether or not that will be positive when it's implemented, we shall see, however, or whether or not you're happy about it, we shall see, but that was the overarching general idea process behind what the new record keeping requirement will eventually unfold. So, when we're talking about record keeping, what are the records that have to be kept? And these are the big three. I'm not talking about LeBron, Bosch, and Wade. We're talking about the Form 300, the 300A, and the 301. Now, depending on the size of your company, uh, maybe you're familiar with all of these forms. Maybe you're only familiar with the top form, the Form 300. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about which employers have to deal with which specific forms. But generally, these are the three record-keeping forms that have to be taken into account when you're talking about these new updating record-keeping requirements. So just as a general principle, the 300 form, that's the log that you have to make whenever there's a workplace-related injury or illness. The 300A is the summary of that workplace illness or injury. And then the 301 is the report that you make based off all or hopefully none workplace injuries or illnesses that take place throughout the year. So you got the log, the summary, then the report. Now, the updates to the record keeping requirement. Looks like a lot, but we're going to go over it uh, detailed here. In 2015, the updated record keeping requirement made employers have to report all work related fatalities within eight hours of the death. And you would have to do that as long as the death occurred within 24 hours of the job. Similarly, when we go down to the actual illness or injury, and that's broken down into amputations, eye loss categories, you would have to report that to OSHA within 24 hours. Then... So if you get somebody run over, <laughs> and the ambulance comes and takes them to the hospital, they don't die on the site, but they die within a certain amount of hours, you got to report it. Or if we continue to not have global warming and have really hot summers, I mean, how many of you guys had someone keel over during a break maybe when they were sitting there having their lunch and trying to cool off? Is that a workplace injury? If they end up going to the hospital and dying of heat stroke, you may want to talk to your lawyer and figure out, do we have to report it? And the uh, Usually the cautious thing to do is go on and report it. That's going to keep you out of trouble. Now is that different than the 30-day deal that they had before with the previous rule? There's always been a rule that you have to do it quickly if it's a death. Well, no, there was a 30-day deal where like, if the guy gets hurt, he doesn't kill him. Of course, it's different now with the whole hospitalization and all that stuff. A perfect example is we had a drywall guy get severely injured. Unless he died within those 30 calendar days, you know, he didn't have to report to OSHA by OSHA's rule. Now, is this different than that? Well, the, the 2015. This is talking about something different. Okay. This right. is when you know close in time to when he was at your site that he died. Okay. It, the, dealing specifically with the fatality from the 2015 update, it was if the person died within eight hours of the workplace incident. So that, that was 
what that specifically was. Um, now, working back down, and thank you, Don, for that, the establishment, and I'll talk a little bit more about establishment versus employer, but in the 2015, you were exempt from the routine record keeping requirement if your establishment had less than 10 employees. And there's a difference between establishment and employers, and we'll talk about that later on. And also that low hazard industries were also exempt from routine record keeping requirements. And specifically in 2015, this, this is a, somewhat of a difference between 2015 and 2017 as far as one of the bigger differences, is that when you were, when, if you were one of the uh, establishments that had to keep these records, you could report it by either calling OSHA directly, you could go to the local OSHA office and report or hand over your handwritten reports, or you could go online and submit your reports that way. So that was in 2015. Now when you compare that to 2017, our first bullet point we have up there is that employers, depending if you're the size of your establishment, if you have to collect the Form 300 or the 300A and the 301, you have to report that electronically now. You can't just call OSHA and report it over the phone. You can't go down to the local OSHA office and hand over your handwritten forms. They're implementing an entire electronic submission for all these types of forms. But in, in my first half of the presentation here, there's going to be three things that I think are, are big, important takeaways. Whenever, whenever these new rules roll out, everyone thinks that, well, is my record keeping requirement going to change? And this is the first thing I want you all to remember, is that unless your, the size of your establishment changes, your record keeping requirement doesn't change. Just the way you submit it does. So if you only had to do the 300, that still is the same when the new uh, record keeping requirement goes in place. It's just the way you have to submit it that has changed. So depending on the size of your establishment, your record keeping requirement itself has not changed. And then also 2017, um, and Don will talk about this in the second half of the presentation, there is a much greater emphasis put on the anti-retaliation aspects of keeping these records, and that will tie into the uh, drug testing that Don will talk about as well. However, just briefly, uh, they're going to reinforce the right to report um, emphasis for employees, and that's something that can be easily um, taken care of as long as you have the poster that OSHA has for you to put in place, um, the right to report poster, and there's more about that information later, but that's, that's one of the things that you can kind of check off as far as making sure you're in compliance with the list of things you need to do as far as anti-retaliation. Having that poster in place is a big thing. Um, there's also clarifications as far as how drug testing is done as far as whether it's reasonable based on the incident compared to making sure it's not deterring anyone from reporting an incident. Um, and also, talking about the anti-retaliation, it was actually supposed to go in place and go into effect at the earliest part of these new rules. It was supposed to go in effect in August. And then, for whatever reason, they decided to push that back to November 1st. And then even more recently, they decided to push it back as far as implementing the anti-retaliation information until December 1st of this year. The reason being is that in the North District of Texas, there's a challenge going on right now in the court. And last I checked, that still hasn't been decided yet. So it's possible that could be pushed back even further. But as of now, the update to the anti-retaliation information is supposed to be going into effect first, which is December 1st of this year. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, also, 2017 establishments with fewer than 20 employees um, at all times, they do not have to regularly submit the record keeping requirement information. They still have to keep the information, but they don't have to regularly submit it. So that's kind of a change. And something we'll talk about a little later on is how the compliance schedule for making sure you're reporting electronically these forms that you have to keep is going to be kind of slowly implemented over the next year or so as far as your deadlines for doing so. And we'll, we'll provide that information to you. So as I was mentioning, what's the difference between an employer and an establishment? So I used the analogy earlier of Walmart versus Target. And an employer would be Walmart, but the establishment would be the individual Walmart stores. So if you have multi um, offices all around the Southeast or so forth, the way you calculate 
your reporting requirement is based on your establishment. So if you have a small annex office in Charleston or something like that, that only has 10 employees, then they're not necessarily going to be subjected to the same reporting requirement as your main office here in Atlanta. However, and yeah, that's something not, not you know, when you first, you think that it's just, if you have 250 employees, period, you're subjected to having to do the 300, 301, and all of that, but it's actually based on your, your offices. And, and I'll also talk about how you calculate how many employees you have per establishment, but, but that's something just to keep in mind. It's an establishment, not employer, as a general rule of calculating how you have to report or not have to report. Something I talked about a little earlier, the compliance schedule, which is basically when will this be rolled out? When will you have to start submitting electronically this information you have to keep based on the size of your establishment? So if you have between 20 and 249 employer, employees in an establishment that's in a high-risk industry, your 2016 forms that you're going to collect, the 300A, you have to submit that by July 1st, 2017. Similarly, the next year, 2017 forms, you have to submit that by July 1st, 2018. And then beginning in 2019, everything that you have to report, or I guess everything, if you're between 200 or 20 and 249, you only have to do the 30A. You have to do everything by March 2nd. And that's, like I say, going to be completely electronic submissions. So. They give you kind of a grace period to figure out how the best way to designate someone to put the information in the computer and all that type of information. However, you will have till July until 2019, then you'll have to submit that information in March for the year prior. Now, if you have, if you're a larger establishment with 250 employees or more, it's the same um, compliance schedule listed above but it applies obviously to the 300, 300A, and the 301. So that's just something to keep in mind. Now, the bottom bullet point here, that's, that's my second point from my first half of the, of the presentation here that I, should, that I want you all to remember and take note of, is that this is the big difference for the 2017 new rule. Is that if you're an establishment that does not have to regularly submit these forms, Depending on what the situation is, if you have 19 employees, um, so you don't have to regularly submit the forms that you're keeping, OSHA can, upon written notice, make you submit a report. So if they, for whatever reason, think that there's something going on, they need to investigate, whatever the reason may be, before it's just if you were exempt, you were exempt, OSHA can now individually reach out to you and ask you to submit a report that you're supposed to be keeping uh, based on that data or information that they might collect from employees. Yes, sir? That, I believe that they could, yes, but the difference here is making you actually submit the 300, the 30A, the 301, all that information, they can contact you directly and say, hey, we need these forms submitted. So that, that's, that's a difference. So you should probably do them even if you're exempted. The exemption goes just to the reporting. Uh, you still had to keep these these records. It's just if you were under 20, or if you were a smaller in, uh, establishment, you wouldn't have to re submit that every year. Although you still had to keep the records. So, okay. thank you for that. Yep. What if uh, for the most of the year you're under 250, but just say in the summer you pick up 270, 280 for a month or two? Jose, that is a great question. How do you determine your requirement? This is how you do it. So. You look at your peak employment per establishment, because remember, your reporting requirement depends on the size of your establishment, not Walmart as, as a whole, just the, the Walmart here in, Cop, or in Marietta. So you look at the peak number of employees you have on one single day. So probably, say it's Walmart, you know, they have seasonal employees, they have part-time employees that are employed to help throughout the holidays. All part-time, seasonal, temporary employees, full-time employees that are working at one time, no matter what, whether it's January 1st, December 31st, that is the number that OSHA looks at as far as what your reporting requirement is. So it will fluctuate, but your peak number of employment 
per establishment is what you have to look to as far as your reporting requirement on that. Have you heard of, of people saying the establishment is like an office or we could say it's a job, like a specific job? Like if I got seven jobs in Georgia, would I say each job is an establishment or would I just refer to the establishment as an office? When you're looking at that type of situation, so everyone, where, where's everyone, where's the records kept? Is it, if it's kept at a home office, that would most likely be your establishment. And Don, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on that, but if you have people all throughout the state, but where, they're, where, they're, where their paycheck comes from, where their information's kept, where their record's kept, that would be the home base as far as the establishment goes for that. get a, a big project and you staff up and everybody's running out of, you know, housing at Fort Benning or something, that that's possibly going to become an establishment for you if you got a trailer there and somewhere to post things. If not, they're going to come back to the home office. You know the checks are coming from wherever they may be coming. Good question. So we touched on this a little bit earlier, but the recording, reporting requirement per establishment size, if your establishment is between 20 and 249 employees in a high-risk industry, the only form you have to submit is the 300A. If it's above 250 employees, that's when you get into the 300, 300A, 301. And just as a reminder, like we talked about earlier, all these going forward, all the reporting has to be done electronically, uh, which is kind of a big difference. But what are the high risk industries? There they are. This is just, so are y'all ready? Here we go. Agriculture, forestry, no, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> but those are all the high risk industries as OSHA designates them. Uh, there are a couple I just wanted to point out because if you do have individual sites, um, depending on what type of equipment you're using, whether or not you could, if you're not in a high-risk industry or you don't, or you have a establishment that isn't, yes, sir. Excuse me. Where is this at on OSHA's site? Do you know? I would, where it is on OSHA's website? I'm like maybe the frequently asked questions. The OSHA's frequent. I think on some of the slides I have a uh, link at the bottom. Uh, if you go there, the, fre the fre frequently asked questions, I think that does have a link directly to the high risk industry list. Because um, well, well, obviously, like everybody in here, we're all trying to figure out how this applies to us. Right. I'll you take this one if you want. I mean, that, that, I mean that's. I mean that's a. <laughs> I mean that. You would. That's a gray area. Um, I would err on the side of caution. I mean, I keep track of all of right. it. It's not a matter of whether I've got the information if they want. I just want to make sure that I'm reporting for the requirements. Well, go back to slide. Why okay. Why are you talking about high risk industries? Yeah. You asking me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> This is for the reporting requirements based on the information you have to keep on the size of your establishment. Yeah, so if your home office has 250 or more, it doesn't matter if you're in a high risk. I mean, we're not. I mean, we might have 35 people. But if you're in that middle one between 20 and 249 and you're not in a high risk, um, 
But, it, yeah. but, it's, your, but it's your industry. Yeah. Not, it's not whether your establishment is it's the company. in the Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So if it's a construction company, it's going to be in the high risk so list of. Subs, there's a lot of things that come under construction. Mm -hmm. Like we're painting. Right. Does that come under the construction heading? Uh, if it's if your company, if you work on a construction right? Yes, and then and but kind of like, like you were saying, I'm going to touch on a couple of these here uh, that jumped out to me. So if you have in-house mechanics working on your machinery, let's say that's at a separate establishment, even your industry would automatically qualify you if you're in construction anyway. But if it's a side company, maybe it's under a different LLC or something of that nature that you have someone mechanics there working on your equipment on the far right column at the bottom, uh, in, you know, industrial machinery repair, things of that nature. Or let's say you get involved in a project and it becomes a joint venture type, type deal where your company ends up being a lessor of the building that you built, helped build. That's also considered a high risk industry uh, under OSHA. Um, warehousing and storage. Because uh, these are also sometimes your main industry is construction, but you might be involved in these other types of industries. So that's just something to keep in mind. There's a couple that I pointed out. Um, I don't think it just comes down to your, your NAICS code that you've got an occupational tax certificate for. I mean, your that's business license yeah. is, is construction. That's what they're going to go to, whether you say, you know, Hey, we, don't, we just sit over here and pray. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that completely. <laughs> All right, so moving on to the next slide. The electronic submission. The three ways that OSHA is going to set up for you to do it. You go onto their manual website and enter the data. That's way number one. The second, you can process multiple establishments at the same time using what's called a CSV file, or, and I think this is what they kind of want to happen, there's going to be a record-keeping app that they're going to roll out so that you can do it on your smartphone from the job site or, or, or wherever, or if you have tablets that are distributed per establishment. Um, and the website that's going to be done is going to supposed to be go live February 2017. But I think I want to stress, you know, this is a government created website and I think last time there was a little bit of issues rolling those things out so it's supposed to go live February tw 2017 but I would say check back for information as far as that goes all right so submitting this information how long is it going to take now disclaimer this is from OSHA's website as far as their estimation on how long it's going to take to submit this information however Per OSHA, if your establishment is the 20 to 249, it's supposed to take 10 minutes to create your account. After you've created your account, submitting the 300A form is supposed to also take 10 minutes. We shall see. If you're on the higher side of the, of the employee per establishment spectrum, also supposed to be 10 minutes to set up your account, 10 minutes for the 300, and then they estimate 12 minutes to submit the 300A and the 301. Um, I, think I got those transposed, the 300 and the 301. So <coughs> that's OSHA's estimation of how long it'll take. So it sounds pretty good, but, but we'll see. Um, and like I touched on a little bit earlier, they plan on creating an app that will allow you to do it quickly and, and on the run. So when you're submitting this information, things you have to think about is your employee's personal identified information. Um, so how is that going to be protected? So OSHA software that they want you to upload this information on is supposed to scrub all of the employee's personally identified information. <laughs> so that goes to the employee name. The <laughs> well, I just want to make everyone aware that you know, what that's supposed to be is the employee name, employee address, the name of the doctor, the name of the hospital. But keep in mind what it doesn't say, and this is, this is going back to a point I made earlier, is the name of the employer. So that's a big difference as far as the information that's going to be available to the public is the employer's name of where this workplace in, uh, injury or illness occurred. So, but a part of the information that isn't scrubbed or supposed to be scrubbed by OSHA 
um, is the employer's name. And this goes to the main overarching thought process behind having this new update is that they want businesses to compare themselves to other businesses inside their own industry. And like I talked about before, the reason being is if Target sees that Walmart is doing way better as far as workplace injuries, then it's supposed to spur, um, based on behavioral science, that Target will make themselves a, a safer place to work. Um, and that, that is something that's different based on the 2017 rule. So, and that, that would be the third big thing to take away from my part of the presentation, um, that the employer's names will be out there as far as where the workplace injury took place. So just going back, the first big thing from my presentation is that the new rule doesn't change your personal record keeping requirement based on your establishment. If it, your establishment size hasn't changed, your, the records you have to keep will not change. The submission will, but the keeping of the records will not. OSHA can make individual requests for you to submit the records that you wouldn't ordinarily have to submit, and that companies are going to be able to compare themselves to other companies inside the relevant industry moving forward. So that will conclude the first part of the presentation. And now I'll pass it over to Don for the anti-retaliation portion. Wasn't retaliation already prevented? Yes. Okay, Congress doesn't pass anything without including a retaliation provision in it. And some of the wording differs in those various statutes. So as an employer, we got different defenses sometimes. But the hard thing about retaliation, whether it's I complained of race discrimination or that I wasn't getting overtime or that you spilled a toxic substance or there's an OSHA violation, is the employee doesn't have to be right to win. If you treat them differently than somebody who didn't complain, even if they're wrong about what they said, a lot of times they can collect. And the number one charge of discrimination before the EEOC now is retaliation, not just under the discrimination statutes, but all these other statutes like the OSHA statute. Uh, one thing that did change is the OSHA statute had an odd wording in it before the new rule that the only people that OSHA could come out and sanction you about who were retaliated against were folks who had actually filed a complaint with OSHA. So if they informally came in and complained to your office manager and then got fired as a troublemaker, but never officially went to OSHA, OSHA couldn't impose a fine and a sanction on you. That's changed under the new one. It's broadened. You know, good-hearted government wanted to protect more people, and you can see how folks in Washington thought that would be a great idea. It's just a little nibbling around the edge, and what we're going to see is some of that continues. So, what is it to retaliate? Well, if you fire them, they're gone. Obviously, that would be the kind of thing that they could sue you over. But also, if they get a reduction in pay, now, few people are stupid enough to actually reduce their pay. But what else could you do that would be sneaky, that would retaliate? Did you file the, you know, the HR tactics of, what is that, what is it called, uh, constructive termination where you just make it miserable for the person? Um, <laughs> the answer, it's a real, it's a, it's a real Well, how else are they going to lose pay? Hours. Hours. You just don't book or you don't let them work the overtime. But they're also going to look at this catch-all, any other adverse action that could discourage somebody or dissuade them from complaining. Um, and would it deter a reasonable person isn't much of a guideline. That just means the judge isn't going to decide. We're going to send it out to a jury probably. So.
a simple way to fulfill your obligation to tell them that you cannot retaliate against them is to put up the poster. Okay. Not so clear when you got folks at lots of other job sites who don't ever come into the office to see the poster. Or if you don't have a trailer at the poster or your guys uh, show up at the GC's trailer but uh, you don't have your own little corner of the bulletin board, let's make sure the GC's got one up, which will probably suffice for you. And let's make sure you got one at the home office. Or if you distribute checks at some temporary office in a strip mall, Let's get one up there, okay? Let's try to be creative. But that's such an easy thing to do to protect yourself that uh, it is one of those things we all ought to take advantage of and not give them an excuse that, well, not only did they retaliate against me, but they also violated this part of the rule that they never told me they couldn't. Not yet, not yet. How many of you guys drug test? Why do you drug test? Excuse me? Well, good point. When do you, when do you drug test? New hires. Excuse? After an incident. Random, reasonable cause. Okay, why do you do it uh, for new hires? Why do you need your certificate? Saves you money. So on what? Workers your workers' comp. Almost every state has a drug-free workplace act provision. However, there are some states that have changed their drug laws. Colorado, maybe? Or the other three that voted it in this last time? They may have changed. We got to check. Sometimes it lags a little bit. They may change their drug free workplace statute about what an employer has to do in order to get the discount on rates. And although that may sound a little out of field here, OSHA. <laughs> apparently had some time on its hands and sat down and figured out, okay, what types of activities dissuade people from reporting safety violations? Well, all the ones we talked about on the other slide, you get fired, you get sent to a crummy part of the plant, uh, you get your work hours reduced. And somebody piped up apparently in that discussion and said, well, if smoking weed is legal in your state, but everybody gets tested when there's an incident, there are folks who won't report because they don't want to be tested. <laughs> uh, so OSHA wrote this long um, interpretive bulletin to help you apply their standard. Okay, let me go back. The new rule does not prohibit post-incident drug testing. However, it does prohibit the use of drug testing or the threat of it as a form of retaliation. Okay, so when is it a threat versus acceptable? How do they prove retaliation? Well, then you have to prove intent. Right. So it has always been an issue in a retaliation case, you have to prove they engaged in some protected activity, they got disciplined or an adverse action, and then you have to prove their protected activity caused the action. 
which is where all the intent comes in. Maybe the employer says something stupid, like we're doing it because you, I'm sick of these bogus uh, safety complaints, but that's kind of rare. It does happen. Um, but they'll look at, well, what were the circumstances? And, and the example they use are things like, suppose you've got a big crane that drops something on a bunch of people. Who's going to get drug tested? Crane operator. Well, that makes sense because if he's under the influence or she's under the influence, that, that would be a reasonable thing to assume. What about the... Uh, the victim, the riggers, the riggers uh, somebody who was supposed to be in charge of making sure everybody was cleared out underneath, okay. the whole group. But suppose you only test the, um, the victim and not the others, and the victim makes a complaint because the victim's family got a lawyer and somebody made a complaint, that might look like retaliation because you've applied the law or your rule in a way that seems to target out the one with the complaint about the safety violation. Now, if, suppose it was a trucking accident where they get whacked. Uh, and the driver of the truck is driving a truck over 10,000 pounds. He's subject to DOT regulations. And the DOT regulations are going to say test him if you're driving and there's an accident and a fatality. So that doesn't fall under OSHA. That falls under some other category that allows you to, excuse me? Could be, absolutely. But just like DOT might give you the excuse to test some but not all of the people involved. That's regardless who's at fault. Yeah. We've also argued over the years that the Drug-Free Workplace Act gives us an excuse or even requires us to test post-accident. And now those laws you got to look at may be changing. negotiations with insurance companies and we submit to 10 different companies to get quotes back and all 10 of them have criteria in there that requires drug testing for certain incidents then as of contractually we're bound to follow whatever those requirements are if we go through with that so where does where does all that play into this once again i wish that camera wasn't on <laughs> uh, I guess I guess the polite way the polite way to say it is we have a lot of insurance companies that hire us to defend employers, right? And just because the insurance company requests it doesn't mean you have the legal authority to violate my rights. Just because the insurance company thinks it'll help them control cost. However, the drug-free workplace statute is a better defense for you, or some DOT reg, or if you're on a federal government contract that requires it, then you got a, you got a great defense on it. So, in, on October 19th of this year, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Regional Administrators of OSHA issued an interpretive bulletin about the retaliation and this new thing about even drug testing can be retaliatory. Listen to this. Section 1904 does not prohibit employers from drug testing employees who were per 
who report work-related injuries or illnesses. So long as they have an objectively reasonable basis for testing, and the rule does not apply to drug testing employees for reasons other than injury reporting. Clear as mud, right? Moreover, OSHA will not issue citations under this section for drug testing conducted under a state workers' compensation law or other state or federal law, right? So if the workers' comp statute gives you the authority to test post-accident, you can do it and not be retaliating under the OSHA statute. This section only prohibits drug testing employees for reporting work-related injuries or illnesses without an objective reason or basis for doing so. So unless you can bootstrap it to another independent statute, you got to have a reasonable basis for testing the people you test post-accident. Yeah, Georgia's got both drug-free workplace and a worker's comp provision that will help you. <coughs> but for those of you that do projects in multiple states, this is a huge headache because you got to check all those other states so that you don't get second-guessed by OSHA on this. Now, you could switch. What would be the safest, easiest thing? And as I talk to people, I always got to tell them, you know, I, I, I am happy to spend your money to give you advice on all these things, but you're not always going to have a lawyer available at some remote project location. What's the best reasonable rule you could implement that will help you, particularly given the sophistication of the people you're going to have on site? plant drugs on them. <laughs> well, that is kind of what I was getting at, is one rule you could, you could adopt would be even post-accident, uh, we're only going to test if there's reasonable suspicion. <coughs> now, that's a, that's a tougher, I don't know that you have to go that far, given the way the, stat, the interpretive bulletin talks about reasonable basis. Because reasonable basis wouldn't require you, that's just thinking about, well, okay, who are the key people in this incident? And, and we ought to test them because they could have had an effect if they were stoned. Reasonable suspicion sounds more like somebody planted drugs or noticed that their pupils were dilated or they were slurring. But we'll have to see how many people get caught with this, and it might be smarter, safer to adopt a reasonable suspicion kind of approach to this. Does it involve supervisory training? Yeah, it has to, because if not, you're going to have a less educated frontline supervisor who won't be able to articulate why he chose to test her when. He's likely to say, well, everybody knows she's a stoner. Or I saw her at the bar last night and she was tanked up, so I, I just assume it made sense to do it now. We can practice if we have a lawyer on site and come up with better reasons to articulate the true underlying beliefs, but that's not always going to be easy. The other thing this OSHA interpretive bulletin said right, was you have to have a reasonable basis, which means in their eyes you can only test for alcohol because testing for the other things won't necessarily show current impairment, right? When you test for drugs, you test for uh, cocaine or meth or whatever, what shows up in the urine is the chemical that's left over that your body made the illegal drug into. And the fact that you have that residue drug doesn't mean you're stoned at the time that's in your urine. It's a step removed. And so they've interpreted this in the OSHA bulletin as 
reasonable basis for testing doesn't include testing for things other than alcohol. What about incentive programs? Can you have a program where you're giving out, uh, you know, a $500 gift card if uh, there's no serious injury where somebody misses work for 30 days? You can if they don't know it. If you surprise them with it, yeah, at the end. But if you tell them at the front end, we're going to do this, if everybody shows up and doesn't have a lost day of work, and then you don't give it out, even if it's in a raffle, OSHA says you're discouraging people from reporting injuries because they want one of them to win the gift card. Somebody had too much time over lunch sitting around there. I mean, it makes sense, but oh my gosh, the minutia they're cranking out at this point. So can you have a gift card for uh, if everybody wears their helmet, uh, ties off for heights, and uh, does lockout tag out sure. for 30 days? Yeah, that's a legitimate safety interest that you can do, but not for just losing. Yeah, if it's tied to an acceptable or mandated work practice then you're safe. But if it's just for not missing work or having no, you know, like those billboards that used to be on the outside of the plant, you know, it's accident free for so many, that's not gonna fly anymore. So you may have to tweak your incentive programs a little bit. Uh, if you do work in multiple state, Georgia doesn't have its own OSHA state agency. Tennessee does. Some of the others around us do. If you work nationally and go where the work is, uh, you may encounter lots of these over there. In general, a state can adapt and, and start their own agency, but they have to at least meet or exceed what the federal OSHA requirements are on any particular issue. And why a state would want to create its own bureaucracy um, could be that they want tougher standards in most cases. Could be that they just want to view it as a revenue enhancement operation. How will the election change this new rule? That was my segue to this. Uh, you know, how many people think that uh, politicians follow through on every promise they make during the election <laughs> campaign? Or that they do it promptly once they get in? Uh, President-elect Trump has talked about streamlining government, taking regulations off business so that uh, job growth can occur. Is that going to be applied to this kind of OSHA rule? Because, you know, even if it takes 10 minutes to set up your account, it, uh, it's another thing you got to record and report. It broadens the retaliation provisions. At least on first blush, I think a lot of people are going to find the hand tying about when you can drug test uh, to also be kind of not something that most pro-business people would be in favor of. Um, I don't have any inside information that I can publicly share. But I do know attorneys I've worked with over the years who have been cooperating with the transition team. And they started last summer making lists of executive decisions that might be rolled back. And although no decision has been made, they're certainly talking about tons of things at DOL, including the new overtime rules about the salary level having to go up in order to be exempt. Uh, and some of this, now OSHA doesn't at all have the bad public image that DOL has, 
among conservative groups or the general public. But this could well be something that for a while we have things in effect that get changed once the new administration comes in. And it may not be immediately. It, it may be six months after they get in. And, and all I can tell you is, um, as a lawyer, I have a duty to tell you to comply with what the law currently is. And as a business person, I think most people will say, let's comply while it is the law. Now, if you get cited and you think the fines are going to go back to where they were before 2016, maybe you want to delay or take a different strategy in how hard you're going to fight it. But we just don't know on some of this stuff what's going to happen next. Have yes, sir. Uh, yes, I've heard a lot of discussion about it. Um, unfortunately, most of the people I've had the discussion with it had large pupils <laughs> and were very concerned about it. I don't think anybody knows, at least I haven't heard anything official about whether President-elect Trump is going to start enforcing the federal laws more aggressively than the current administration which federal law is going to overtake, it'll be illegal, no matter what the state has said. I don't know what the NFL is going to do. That's had some publicity recently because they've got franchises in multiple states now where it's legal. And they have a whole bunch of employees with pain problems. Yeah, great example. That's not going to keep them from going into Vegas. But, uh, you know, why do you test, I guess sort of this is kind of convoluted, but why do you test new hires? I used to have employers in North Georgia that said, well, we're not really going to test them. We're just going to put up a sign that says we do. And the stone ones will look at the sign and never come in to make an application. And that kind of helps, but you know, you got to be realistic about when you're testing, can we get the kind of people we need if we're going to test? <laughs> and sometimes you decide that's just not realistic given what we're paying and what's in the population. And here there will be lots of employers who um, either are sympathetic to the drug laws in these progressive states or don't want to lose those employees. I mean, my thought too is I, I, I thought about with the military. There, there's some jobs in the military where you get around and protest it pretty regularly. It'd be easy enough in a place like that <coughs> to be exposed. I mean, it, I, I got a feeling a lot of those people, they're just staying away from anywhere they think might. Yeah. You know, not come within 100 feet of it because they're afraid of that. Right, and the military drug tests are not going to be saddled with this current impairment thing. They're going to be looking for the residue drugs in your system for sure. Well, Sam? Yes, sir. Great job. <laughs> Thank you all very much. If you have questions, we can hang around, but uh, appreciate the opportunity, and we'll get you out of here a little early. <laughs>